Judgment in the appeal, Barnes and the East Enders Group and another. Lord Toulson will summarise the judgment that he has prepared, which again is the judgment of the court. The appellants are a group of companies in the business of selling products, including alcohol, at cash and carry outlets. On the 6th December 2010, the Crown Prosecution Service, CPS, applied to a judge at the Central Criminal Court for restraint and receivership orders against two individuals who controlled the companies and against the companies themselves. The application was made under sections 41 and 48 of the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002. The CPS had begun a criminal investigation into the activities of the two individuals. They were suspected of being involved in a large-scale excise duty and VAT fraud. The companies were not the subject of the investigation, but they featured in it because the individuals were suspected of using the companies to carry out the fraud. The judge was invited to lift the corporate veil and to treat the company's assets as assets of the individuals. The purpose of the restraint and receivership orders was to prevent the individuals and companies from dealing with their assets and to place them under the management of a receiver in order that they should be available to meet any confiscation order which might be made in the event of the individual's conviction. The application was listed at short notice before a judge who was in the middle of hearing a complicated murder trial. He dealt with the application at hearing lasting a little over half an hour and made the order for which the CPS applied. He appointed as receiver a partner in a well-known firm of chartered accountants. The order provided that the receiver was to be paid out of the assets of the companies in accordance with a prior agreement made between the CPS and the receiver as to the basis on which he was to act. On the 26th of January 2011, the order was quashed by the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. After a hearing lasting a day and a half, during which the court examined in detail the evidence put forward by the CPS, the court held that there was no good arguable case for regarding the company's assets as the assets of the two individuals. The evidence before the court showed that at least 95% of the company's business was demonstrably legitimate, and the CPS was not able to resist that conclusion. By this time, however, the receiver's costs and remuneration were put at over £750,000. The issue before the court is who should bear that sum, the companies, the CPS, or the receiver himself. The receiver applied to the court for an order that the funds necessary to pay him should be taken from the company's assets in accordance with the order as originally made. Mr Justice Underhill refused the application, holding that to grant it would be a breach of the company's rights under Article 1 to Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights, commonly known as A1P1, to peaceful enjoyment of their possessions. But he ordered that the receiver should be entitled to recover his costs and remuneration from the CPS. The CPS appealed to the Court of Appeal. The majority agreed with Ms Justice Underhill that to take the costs of receivership out of the company's assets would in those circumstances be a breach of the company's rights under A1P1, but they held that there was no power under the Act to order payment by the CPS, and so the receiver was left unable to recover either from the companies or from the CPS. Lord Justice Law's dissenting would have held that the receiver's costs should be met from the company's assets. The receiver has appealed to this court. The court unanimously concludes that the right order is for the receiver to receive or to recover his costs from the CPS. The court's reasoning falls into two parts. The first part relates to whether it would be a breach of the company's A1P1 rights if the costs of receivership were taken from the company's assets. The second part relates to the liability of the CPS. 
On the first part, the critical judgment to be made is one of proportionality. It is an established principle of a common law of receivership that a court-appointed receiver is ordinarily entitled to recover his remuneration and expenses from the assets which he is appointed to manage, even if that order is later set aside, and the receiver has a right over the assets, known in law as a lien, for the recovery of those costs. However, on the facts of this case, there was no reasonable basis for the order to be made. The companies were not defendants, and there was no reasonable ground for regarding their assets as belonging to the individuals under investigation. The court concludes, in agreement with the lower courts, that it would, in these circumstances, be a disproportionate interference with the company's rights if their assets were confiscated to fund the execution of an order which ought never reasonably to have been made against them. As to whether the uh, receiver is entitled to recover his costs from the CPS, uh, the court concludes that to leave the receiver unpaid would be a breach of his rights under A1P1, for he would have been deprived of his lien through no fault on his part without any compensation. That would be unjust. However, he undertook the responsibilities of receivership under a letter of agreement with the CPS, and the court is satisfied that he is entitled, in the circumstances of this case, to be paid by the CPS under principles of law which are known under the heading of unjust enrichment. They include cases where services are provided or a payment is made under an agreement the basis for which has failed. Here, the whole basis on which the receiver agreed to act was that he was to have a lien over the company's assets, and that has failed. Enrichment, for the purposes of the law of unjust enrichment, is capable of including the provision of services. Here, the receiver provided services at the request of the CPS, and it would be unjust if he were not paid for them. The court, therefore, dismisses the receiver's appeal against the refusal of his application to recover his remuneration and expenses from the companies, but allows his appeal against the CPS, so restoring the position ordered by Mr. Justice Underhill. Finally, it is obvious that things went seriously wrong in this case, and the court, in its judgment, emphasizes a number of matters which need careful consideration by the CPS and the court when dealing with applications for restraint and receivership orders.